Hi, and welcome to another edition of First Chapter Fridays. My name is Miss Virginia, and I work here at the Alameda Free Library. Um, today, I'm going to share a book uh, with you. It's actually written by an actor. Normally, I don't uh, recommend books written by celebrities, but in this case, it's actually a pretty good book, and you might recognize the actor. Um, it, the book is called Troublemaker. It's by John Cho, and he had a little help uh, with another author. Let's see, I wanna give her credit to Sarah Sook is the other author. They worked together to create this book. It's a story about the Los Angeles riots that happened in the early 1990s, so well before your time. Some of your parents might remember it, um, but it may actually be before their time as well, because the 90s were forever ago, right? Um, anyway, let me show you a picture of John Cho, and then you'll have a better idea of who he is. He's been in the Star Trek movies and a couple other movies, maybe a TV show. I'm not familiar with the TV shows, um, but he definitely was in the Star Trek movies, which I liked. Anyway, John Cho, Troublemaker. And this is available on Libby as an audiobook as well as an ebook. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the jacket um, like I usually do. And it starts with, sometimes good intentions lead to bad decisions. Jordan feels like he can't live up to the example his older sister set, nor his parents' expectations. When he returns home from school one day, hoping to hide his suspension, Los Angeles has reached a turning point. In the wake of the acquittal of the police officers filmed beating Rodney King, as well as the shooting of a bl young black teen, Latasha Harlins, by a Korean store owner, the country and their city are in crisis. As tensions escalate, Jordan's father leaves to check on the family store, spurring Jordan and his friend Mike to embark on a dangerous journey to come to his aid. This gripping page-turning debut novel grapples with important issues, including racism, guns, family, and community. And I didn't mention it, but Jordan's family is Korean American. So let's go ahead and get started. And I also want to mention that there are some Korean words in here. I'm going to do my best to pronounce them properly, but please forgive me if I pronounce them incorrectly. I'm trying. Chapter 1, April 29th, 1992. I never knew a pair of shoes could scare me so much. But when I see Uma's and Appa's sneakers by the door, when I walk in, I nearly jump right out of my skin. It's not that they're anything out of the ordinary, the shoes I mean, with Appa's laces fraying at the ends and Uma's looking more gray than white, like they did when she first bought them. What's weird is the fact that they're here at all. It's just a little after 4 p.m. on a Wednesday, and Uma and Appa should both be at the store, not at home. I thought I'd have more time before I'd have to face them today. Their voices are quiet, muffled, coming from the direction of the kitchen. I stand real still by the door, listening, but I can't hear what they're saying from here. I move carefully down the hall, gripping the straps of my backpack, with both hands praying in my head, don't see me, don't see me, don't see me. Just as I'm about to pass the kitchen, Uma looks right up at me. Oh, Jordan, you're home, she says in Korean. She says it all casual, like she's here every day when I get home from school, like I'm not the one who should be saying, oh, Uma, you're home. Yeah, I say back in English. A nervous feeling starts to spread through my stomach. My prayer changes. Don't ask me how school was. Don't make me lie to you. By some miracle, she doesn't. She just smiles and nods, turning back to Appa to carry on talking about whatever they were talking about, the air kind of tense and tight between them. Huh, that's weird. Uma always asks how school was. It's pretty much her favorite question. Not to mention, I still don't know what they're both doing home so early. I linger by the door, wondering whether I should ask or not. But the more questions I ask them, the more questions they might ask me. And I want to avoid that for as long as possible. Not that Appa would ask me anything, though. This whole time, he hasn't even looked at me once. I don't know whether to be relieved 
or disappointed. It's been this way between us for weeks, ever since our big fight. Things haven't been the same since then. It's like time split into a before and after. Before, when I was just Jordan and he was just Appa, and I didn't think twice about being in the same room together. After, when we're not just Jordan and Appa anymore, we're Jordan who doesn't know what to say around Appa, and Appa who basically completely ignores Jordan. He's been so cold to me lately, ice cold. Maybe he's waiting for me to say sorry first, but there's no way I'm going to do that. Maybe this means we'll never talk again until the end of time. Maybe not even then. I stare at the back of his head for a second longer and then I walk away. Harabojis in the living room watching TV and eating ojinjo off a plate. At least grandparents are dependable, always where you think they'll be, sitting on the care couch, wearing a fishing vest with a hundred pockets, even though you can't remember the last time you've ever actually seen them go fishing, a piece of dried squid between their teeth. At least that's my grandpa. I don't really know about anyone else's grandparents. Hi, Haraboji. I'm home, I say, dropping my backpack on the floor and sitting down next to it. He grunts, not even looking up from the TV. He's watching some sitcom I don't recognize. His favorites are usually Full House and Home Improvement, the light re reflecting off his huge re rectangular glasses. Haraboji is not much of a talker except when it comes to yelling at fictional characters on the screen. I don't even know if he knows what's going on. It's been nine years since we immigrated to Los Angeles for, from Korea altogether, and I'm still not sure how much English he understands. He didn't want to come with us at first, to America, that is. He wanted to stay in Korea, in the same house where he and my grandma had lived for, together for years, saying he wanted to die in the same room she did. But Appa said it would be the best thing for all of us and that he wasn't going to leave his own father behind. Eventually convinced Haraboji to pack up his life and get on a plane with us. Though I remember Haraboji being unhappy about it. At least he's found some joy in these American shows. I think he finds them funny. I glanced toward the kitchen and then back at Haraboji, lowering my voice. Can I tell you something? He grunts again without turning down the volume. Here's the thing about my grandpa. We're not close exactly, but he's the one person in this family that I feel like I can really talk to, even if he doesn't totally get what I'm saying since I speak to him in English. Maybe that's the reason why I feel okay. Or maybe it's because he, he's too busy judging made up people on television to judge me. And I know that whatever I tell him, he won't tell anyone else. I got suspended from school today. At this, his eyebrows lift. I can't be sure if it's from what I said or from something on TV, but I keep going. I got sent to the principal's office again for cheating on a Spanish quiz, or I guess getting caught cheating again. Mr. Martins was so mad. I make a face hearing his voice in my head. He always talks real slow, like he's speaking through a mouthful of chewing gum. He kept saying how he's seen me in the office more than any other sixth grader in school, and how he can't even count how many times I've been caught cheating now. And then you know what he says? He says, I should try to be more like Sarah. Says that when she was in middle school, she was a model student. How could the Park siblings be this different? She probably makes your parents so proud. And you, well, they'll be so disappointed in you, won't they? I scoff, but I can feel my shoulders slumping. Mr. Martins doesn't need to tell me what a dis disappointment I am to my parents. I already know that. Appa told me so himself. Her Haraboji turns off the TV, startling me. He leans forward in his seat, his left hand on his knee. He only got three, he's only got three fingers on that hand. He lost the pinky and ring finger during the Korean War. Uma says it's rude to stare, but it's hard when he's, when it's hard not to when I'm sitting on the floor and basically eye level with it. I look at his face instead. He locks his eyes on mine, his mouth set in a grim line. Uh-oh, did I overestimate how safe my secrets are with him? My face flushes, 
Is he going to rat me out to Uma and Appa after all? He holds out his empty plate with his right hand. Get me more ojinjo, he says in Korean. I ate it all. Oh, of course. Yes, Haraboji. I take the empty plate and head for the kitchen. But as I get closer, I can hear Uma and Appa talking. Only it's not in those low voices I heard earlier. They're louder now, almost yelling. Are they fighting? I stay in the hallway, listening. My Korean's not so great anymore, but I can understand more than I can speak. And I pick up every word. I think you're worrying too much about nothing, Appa says. You can never be too careful, Uma says back. She sounds exasperated, angry. People are mad about what happened with Rodney King. Tell me, you're not even a little bit worried that something bad might come out of it today? Of course they're mad. Who wouldn't be mad? Now Appa's the one who sounds annoyed. Doesn't mean that bad things are going to happen. There's no reason to think so. It will be fine. You heard what they said on Radio Korea. They said there may be protests, so we should pay attention, stay alert. And we did, didn't we? We closed the shop early and came home. That's enough. You're always thinking further ahead than you need to. How do you think I've carried us this far? I won't let this store fail like our last one. Someone has to think about this family. It's like she sucker punched him with her words. There's this long silence. I don't even realize it at first, but I'm holding my breath. I feel like if I let it out, the plate in my hands will crack, the air will explode, and Haraboji will never get his squid because there's thunder and lightning, lightning standing between me and the kitchen. Uma is the thunder. Maybe she's the lightning too. Fine, she finally says, I'll go. Go where? To board up the store. Before Appa can reply or even take a step, Uma storms out of the kitchen. She doesn't see me. She's too focused, pushing the little wisps of hair falling from her stubby ponytail out of her eyes and reaching for the coat closet. She grabs the handle of the sliding mirror door and pulls hard. What happens next is everything shatters. At first, I think I've dropped Haraboji's plate, but when I look down, it's still in my hands. It wasn't me that broke, it was Uma. The closet door's always been too flimsy, teetering on loose tracks, and Uma's pulled it so hard, it finally gave up and jumped the tracks. The whole mirror door cracks and explodes into shards on the floor. She yells, jumps back, and then stands there, breathing heavy. What was that? Haraboji shouts from the living room. Everything's fine, Uma shouts back, even though I think what she means is really the opposite. Appa comes out of the kitchen and looks at Uma, standing there with that broken mirror all around her. Then he notices me. Sometimes I forget how tall he is, but when he looks at me, he has to look way down the way I do when I look at ants on the sidewalk. He stares and I stare back right at his bushy eyebrows and the permanent furrow in his brow like God stuck his thumb there for too long and left a dent. It's the first time we've really made eye contact since the big fight. I'm bracing myself all over. I think maybe he's going to say something and he does, but not to me. He walks over to Uma and puts his hands on her shoulders. I'll go board up the store, he says. I'll call you when I'm there. Then he reaches into the doorless coat closet and grabs his jacket. He takes his car keys off the hook on the wall, puts on his shoes with the fraying laces, and leaves. He doesn't look back once. I'm going to stop there. Um, that's where uh, the trouble begins. And again, this is John Cho's book, Troublemaker. It's a really good read. It's um, You learn a little bit about what happened during those times um, with the protests and riots and everything that was going on. Um, I highly recommend it, even though it's written by a celebrity. Uh, so check it out, John Cho's Troublemaker. And again, it is also available on Libby as an ebook and an e-audio book. We'll see you next time at First Chapter Friday. Take care, everyone.